I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Amazon workers in Alabama vote not to unionize. That is the latest in the historic election, where there are still disputed ballots being counted and accusations of intimidation by Amazon officials. We'll have the latest and Amazon's response. Plus, it is on track to be one of the most successful fun launches ever. We're talking the ARCX Space ETF, which gained more than $500 million in its first five days of trading. We'll talk to Renato Leggi of ARC. And the story of WeWork's rise and spectacular fall, including controversy around its founder, Adam Newman. The story captured in a new documentary that investigates its origins. We'll talk to the filmmaker behind it. All those stories in a moment, but first U.S. stocks climbing to another record as investors seem to focus on prospects for an economic rebound. Bloomberg's Katie Greifeld and Ed Ludlow have the stories. Katie, let's start with you. Well, Emily, as the screen shows, it was a very strong week overall for the stock market. You had the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq 100 both ending higher. And I will point out that this was the third week of gains in a row for both of those benchmarks. Chips also had a good week, lagging a little bit, but still positive. But really, it was your big fang names were the star of the show. That index up about 4.8 percent fueling the Nasdaq 100. And let's stick with tech because really we've seen a big rebound in this sector. The Nasdaq 100 actually closed at a new record today. And as you can see, it was a rocky road getting there. The, net, the index actually went negative on the year in March, but really rebounding in a big way now. Treasury yields settling down has a big thing, big part of this story. That's helping tech rebound here. But if you are looking for a warning sign, it could be that this latest rally is coming on the heels of very low trading volume. If we look over the past week, over the past year, trading volume dropped almost every day this week. And that has some traders saying that this calm isn't going to last. Now, what the catalyst will be is anyone's guess. But Ed, I will point out that we do have earnings kicking off next week. So that could be a potential trigger. Yeah, and a big part of the reopening right. story, the economic story, is vaccines as well, right? Which is why I'm looking at them as movers on Friday. Two big key pieces of news, but Pfizer and BioNTech looking at expanding that vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds. That's been a big discussion around a vaccine, the age of eligibility, boosting the stocks on Friday. Also news that the European Commission wants to get hold of almost two billion vaccine doses in the next coming days. And that you can see really pushing Moderna up 5.3% on Friday. Best performer on the Nasdaq 100. Johnson & Johnson are under a little pressure, down 1%. There's some safety concerns with that vaccine. Flip up the boards. It's really interesting. There's been mixed fortunes for these stocks so far year to date. And we need to remind ourselves of one thing. Those outperformers, uh, not that chart, but those outperformers that are doing best, you're talking about Moderna and BioNTech, the vaccine makes up such a bulk of their revenue. But if you compare that with Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer, those are big pharmaceutical companies, big healthcare providers. And in th that case, the vaccine is important, but it's a really teeny tiny proportion of the sales that they bring in. Also want to talk about U-Time. This is an incredible story if we flip up the boards with U-Time. This is a Chinese telecommunications company that IPO'd on Tuesday at $4 per share. It had 857% gain on day one, the best IPO debut since 1999. Fast forward to Friday, we're up more than 1,000% after some topsy-turving trading. Why? Anyone's guess. One trader saying that this is mind-blowing, but it could be people really wanting to get in early on IPOs. An astonishing story. We'll be following you time because I hadn't heard of it before this week, but my goodness, do I know about it now. And of course, one story we can't get away from to finish is Amazon. Amazon workers in Alabama voting against unionizing on Friday. Shares up 2.2%, the best day in a month, and shares near their highest level since February. But what's interesting is the stock kind of treaded water for a few days. Investors didn't really pay much attention. This is the story, right? 
Amazon has been kind of middle of the pack, one of the underperformers relative to those big cap tech stocks so far in 2021. It's the only mega cap tech stock that hasn't breached its 2020 record. So maybe investors were kind of in wait and see mode to see what happened with this union vote. But as I said, workers voting against unionizing now on the focus on the growth story for these big cap tech stocks in 2021. Emily. All right, Bloomberg said, love, love, thanks so much. Sticking with Amazon, workers at an Alabama warehouse, warehouse voting not to join a union, as I'd mentioned, in a setback for labor organizers and a big victory for the world's largest online retailer. Earlier, we heard from AFL-CIO President Richard Trumka, who said America's labor laws are a disgrace to the world market. America's labor laws are a disgrace on the world market uh, with, with all civilized worlds. They were done 100 years ago. And in the times that they have been changed, the two times since then, they've been made weaker for workers. This is the truth, David, and every worker out there knows it. Corporations are too strong and workers are too weak. And the only way we're gonna change that is to band together as one and get the PRO Act passed. For more now, we're joined by Bloomberg Tech Spencer Soper, who, of course, covers Amazon for us. So, Spencer, still some disputed ballots being counted, but uh, Amazon appears to have resoundingly won this vote. What is next? Well, the, the retail wholesale department store union, you know, which is the petitioner in this case, has promised to, to challenge, um, you know, it can make various arguments. But this margin, you know, is more than a two to one margin of no votes to yes votes. Um, it was pr pretty big landslide loss for the union, which which factors into its challenges, because and anything that the union brings up, the, the National Labor Relations Board has to ask itself, OK, even if Amazon did this, even if this was wrong, would it affect the outcome? And when when Amazon's got this real healthy margin of, of more than two to one a uh, nose to every yes, uh, it, 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 it makes that a tough argument to make. So let's talk about how Amazon has responded. They even uh, admitting that, that these are the accusations out there. Amazon saying in a statement, it's easy to predict the union will say that Amazon won this election because we intimidated employees, but that's not true. We welcome the opportunity to sit down and share ideas with any policymaker who wants to pass laws ensuring that all workers in the U.S. are guaranteed at least $15 an hour, health care from day one, and other strong benefits. Um, the union, uh, Spencer, now pledging to appeal, but... Um, you know, in, in your reporting, in your investigation, to what extent do you believe that happened at all, that Amazon did intimidate employees? Certainly the union was outspent. We haven't seen specific allegations of intimidation in Bessemer. Um, the, the closest thing is this notion that there was like a mailbox put there that could help Amazon somehow surveil the votes. That's kind of a wild card that uh, the union might be able to play is why did they put this mailbox up on site where, you know, they've got, you know, could have security cameras monitoring the vote count. That's one thing that could get Amazon in a little trouble. But in terms of workers being directly told, like, don't, don't vote for the union, you're going to be fired, or you'll be fired for union agitation. Nothing like that has surfaced yet. Could that come out later? Sure. Um, we have seen Amazon fire people elsewhere where it's been uh, been alleged um, and and it's being investigated that they were fired for advocating uh, for better working conditions, but but not specifically um, in Bessemer. And the big thing is like even if they were to get another election, the union can push for for a revote. How do they how do they get more workers to vote? Yes, you know when they lost by more than a two to right. two to one margin. The bottom line is they pay Amazon pays pretty well compared to other places that are hiring in Bessemer where the minimum wage is, you know, like seven and change an hour. So for a lot of a lot of workers are pretty happy to get the job at Amazon, pretty happy with the pay and happy with the benefits. All right. Interesting uh, to hear that perspective. Spencer Bloomberg, Spencer Soper, thanks so much for your reporting on this. The story is certainly not over. I imagine we'll be continuing to report on this for years to come. All right, coming up, the hottest COVID-19 spot in the U.S. right now is Michigan, where officials are calling for the federal government to prioritize more vaccines to the state as it reported more than 49,000 cases 
in the last week. All the details next. This is Bloomberg. Michigan officials are taking steps to slow the worst outbreak in the United States right now. Governor Whitmer has asked residents to voluntarily suspend social activities for two weeks. Like other Midwestern states, Illinois, seeing COVID cases jump even as vaccinations accelerate. This, as the World Health Organization warns that the pandemic is on the wrong trajectory after six weeks in a row of increases in cases and deaths. For more, I want to bring in Bloomberg Senior Editor Jody Schneider. So jo Jody, what do you make of this? Why are cases accelerating even as vaccines are accelerating across the country? Well, in one word, Emily, it's variants. Uh, these variants, which are fast spreading, um, are really hitting some states very hard, and Michigan is among them. That's why we're seeing Governor Whitmer take that action uh, to ask uh, people to voluntarily uh, stop activity. She's not doing a shutdown. That would seem politically uh, unpalatable now, but uh, they are having a huge spread. There are 49,000 new cases, which has uh, been a big increase in just the past few weeks. So it's really those fast spreading variants. And they're also seeing younger people be affected, uh, people in their teens and early 20s, people who have not yet been vaccinated because, of course, the vaccination effort started with older people first. So uh, we're really starting to see this group that had not been affected before uh, get the virus. And of course, uh, hospitalizations have gone up as a result as well. So of course, Governor Whitner now asking uh, the Biden administration for more support on the vaccine front. In the meantime, you also have Pfizer and BioNTech uh, seeking to expand vaccine access to teenagers. What can you tell us about you know, how ready the vaccine is for adolescents. Well, Pfizer and BioNTech did uh, say today they announced that they're going to be making a request that they expand the emergency use authorization they have in the U.S. and in other countries uh, after a bit uh, to include uh, 12 to 15 year olds. And studies have shown that uh, the, vi the vaccine uh, is as effective uh, in preventing uh, serious cases of COVID from uh, that age group as it is for uh, adults. So it's a good sign they're asking for that. Uh, Governor Whitmer saying in the meantime, she'd like more vaccines sent to her state because of that uh, surge there. Although the government is saying, uh, the federal government and the Biden administration is saying they're not changing their policy. They're sending a vaccine to states based on population, not on the severity okay. of the outbreaks there. So for now, they're not going to get more in Michigan, but uh, it looks like uh, that authorization may be soon coming for younger adults and, uh, for, I'm sorry, for teenagers. And of course, that would be a big help before the school year starts in the fall, getting all those uh, teenagers right. vaccinated. Uh, Jody, thank you so much. Your whole team um, keeping us up to date. Our Bloomberg senior editor, Jody Schneider, who of course has been covering the pandemic and the vaccine rollout for us. I want to turn now to Brazil, the country that has recorded more than 4,200 COVID-related deaths, COVID deaths just since Thursday, its highest single day toll of the pandemic. Some scientists predict Brazil could outpace the United States to become the world's most lethal Hotspot. This, as the richest state of Sao Paulo, will move to the so-called red phase of the reopening plan there. I'm joined now by our Bloomberg Brazil chief, Julia Lecce. Julia, thank you so much for joining us. So why is the situation in, in Brazil accelerating so much? Um, I think a lot of what's happening here is very similar to what Jody was just explaining about Michigan. Um, we have a new variant that emerged here um, in Manaus, which is a city in the north uh, of the country, and it is much more contagious, um, possibly more lethal. And what we're really seeing is the virus rage through a younger population, right? Um, before the first phase, it was the elderly and people that had comorbidities. And now what we're seeing is patients getting younger, getting very, very sick and dying in the hospital very, very young in their 20s, 30s and 40s. So what is President Bolsonaro doing about this? Has he changed his approach since the early days of the crisis? 
he has changed his approach somewhat. Um, he was very adamant about um, not wanting to be vaccinated himself. Um, and just very dismissive of vaccines, took a while to actually buy vaccines. And that leaves Brazil um, very behind in the race, right? We've only fully vaccinated about 3% of the population, um, which is a very, very low number. If you compare it, you know, the U.S., I think you were at 20% for fully vaccinated. Um, but Bolsonaro, on the other hand, continues to speak against um, any sort of restrictions, so lockdowns. His argument is that the economic toll of, a, you know, everybody at home is way worse than what the virus is. And what he keeps saying is, you know, people die anyway. We have to we have to live with it and we have to move on. Absolutely. And that is a stark reminder of just how much of the global population remains to be vaccinated. All right. Our Bloomberg Brazil chief, Julia Lecce, thank you so much for calling in and giving us the situation on the ground there. Coming up, a new space ETF rocketing higher. Why it is on track to become the best performing fund ever and what the critics are saying. That's next. This is Bloomberg. The boom in space exploration, satellites, and a burgeoning space economy has caught the attention of ARK Invest's Kathy Wood, who just launched the space-focused ARKX ETF. The fund has been on a tear since its debut at the end of March, with investors adding over $600 billion in under two weeks. But others, still skeptical. Some companies included in the fund are Netflix and John Deere, which don't seem to have an obvious place in a space exploration ETF. With me now for more, Renato Leggi, who is a client portfolio manager at ARK Invest. Ren, thank you so much for joining us. So let's start with the good news. The ETF on track for one of the most successful launches ever. Some of the expected names in there, Virgin Galactic and Boeing. What's driving the initial growth? Yeah, so what we're seeing is rat, uh, rocket and satellite costs are finally starting to decline, and that's thanks to advancements in, in deep learning, 3D printing, robotics. And we believe that these cost uh, declines are, are hitting kind of a tipping point that are going to unleash a tremendous amount of demand over the next five to 10 years. And in fact, according to our research, we think the aerospace industry, uh, so including satellite connectivity and hypersonic travel, will exceed uh, $370 billion annually. Uh, and this includes you know, portfolio companies like Iridium and, and Virgin Galactic, like you mentioned. Um, also, keep in mind that this is all only part of what we're investing in. Uh, we're really including anything above ground. Um, so these are these are companies uh, that are manufacturing and developing autonomous drones uh, and platforms like Trimble, uh, Kratos, uh, L3 Harris. Uh, we're also I investing in uh, some of these enabling technologies like 3D printing and uh, also the, the key beneficiaries of these aerospace industry and, and really kind of global connectivity via satellites. So let's talk about why there are companies like Netflix, Alphabet, and John Deere in this portfolio. Explain that to me, how that ties into space. Yes, yeah, so I, I think people are surprised to, to see those holdings. Uh, Deere, Netflix, Google, Alibaba, Tencent uh, in a space fund. But I think that's really what differentiates us and kind of re represents a significant market inefficiency out there in uh, the public equity market. And I think that's true for, for many of these disruptive technologies that we are, are trying to capitalize on. So, uh, you know, Netflix will benefit from kind of this global connectivity, right? Um, Three billion pe people uh, around the globe do, do not have access to the internet. Uh, just in the U.S. alone, 40 million people don't have access to broadband internet. So uh, Netflix will kind of benefit from that. They, they are a key beneficiary of this global connectivity via satellites. And many of the more high profile space companies are still private, like SpaceX, like Blue Origin. Has that made it harder to find the right names? Do you plan to bet on those names if and when they do go public? So we, we are certainly keeping an eye on, on many of the private companies as well. Uh, we're, we're seeing an, an uptick in uh, private companies going public via SPACs. So we are, are certainly, uh, that's expanding the universe and, and opportunities. Uh, but we, we do keep an eye on valuation. That's been kind of pushing us away from some of these companies that have recently gone public, uh, even though they, they are more poor, pure play 
uh, companies, right? Uh, just because they fit the space theme doesn't necessarily mean it makes sense from a valuation standpoint. That That is really what's important. Uh, can these opportunities deliver kind of long-term returns and growth for investors? Now, ARC obviously has a huge retail following as well. What percentage of the investors here are retail investors? Um, so we have uh, roughly, I think it's around 80% of our, our client base uh, is, is retail. That that also includes kind of uh, the financial intermediaries, so the, the big banks uh, and advisors as well. Uh, it's it's a, little, a little challenging to uh, see exactly who is holding our ETFs. We don't have that, as much transparency as, as, say, kind of a mutual fund. Um, so uh, we do know that several, uh, there are a lot of institutional investors holding our ETFs as well. So sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, endowments, foundations. And obviously, Kathy has become quite a celebrity, not just on Wall Street, but beyond. And the launch of this space ETF has sparked a whole new genre of videos on TikTok about Kathy. I'm curious what your take is on that reaction. You know, we uh, we keep uh, our head down and, and and focus on our research and identifying these disruptive technologies and investing in them. Um, you know, part of the process is is part of this open research ecosystem. So we push all of our research out there as it's happening, and uh, we we like feedback from the communities, especially those that are kind of uh, driving some of these innovations forward. So we 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 interact with. Uh, there's certainly a lot of no no noise out there, but we interact with a lot of earlier stage venture capitalist investors, you know, people from academia, professors, uh, entrepreneurs, people that are driving some of these technologies forward. Uh, and that creates, um, you know, uh, opportunities for us to, to better understand not only these technologies, but, but who those winners will be in each of these areas. And just 30 seconds, Ren, do you ever have a concern that some of these ambassadors might be giving people the wrong information? Um, so, I mean, you know, we, we actually do a lot of our research and we push a lot of our research out there on, on Twitter, uh, social media, and there's there's kind of a natural filter, right? We, we're able to kind of create our analysts because they have domain expertise in the technologies uh, that we're researching. Uh, they have the ability to kind of connect with those that are driving some of these technologies forward. And so uh, they, they provide a lot of uh, valuable insight. You know, when we're trying to forecast exponential growth over a multi-year period, um, you, you could certainly make a, a okay. if you make okay. a correct assumption, uh, that, could, that could lead to a, a, an, an exponential mistake. And, and having that feedback uh, helps with kind of this iterative uh, process. All right. Well, it's been fascinating to watch the launch. We'll keep following Ren Leggy, ARK Invest Client Portfolio Manager. Thanks so much for joining us. And coming up, we're going to hear more of my Studio 1.0 interview with Melinda Gates about the unequal distribution of COVID vaccines and how governments could and should be doing more. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Well, from the worldwide chip crisis to the global pandemic, the International Monetary Fund and World Bank spring meetings are being held virtually this week. And while the IMF upgraded its global economic growth forecast, concerns around the widening inequality of the global vaccine rollout front and center. We took a deep dive into those concerns. The global economy is on course for its fastest growth in more than half a century this year. But the road ahead looks very different depending on where you are, in part because of the rollout of vaccines. Vaccine policy is an economic policy and that only vaccinating everybody everywhere would get us out of the risk of this mutation. Growing vaccine nationalism is hitting the world's most disadvantaged nations the hardest in what the head of the World Health Organization is calling a grotesque supply chasm between rich and poor nations. The hope of global solidarity in fighting COVID-19 pandemic, it's waning as many of the poorest nations continue to wait for millions of doses. No longer can we expect poor countries to stand in a queue waiting to get vaccines. I mean, the fact as the WHO uh, DG said, that 70% of vaccine doses today have been administered by 10 countries. The inequity of access is glaring. 
The world's biggest vaccine manufacturer, India's Serum Institute, is a key supplier to COVAX. That's the program through which 2 billion vaccine doses are supposed to be distributed to middle and low-income countries, many of which have no ability to sign procurement contracts on their own. Now plans are to pare back these 2 billion shipments to tend to a new wave of domestic infections. Poorer countries are being left behind, while developed nations such as the UK power ahead, with most of the adult population having already received a vaccine. In the US, while it's celebrating almost 170 million shots in arms, though it is pledging to do more outside of its borders. The world has to come together to bring the COVID pandemic to an end everywhere. And for that to happen, the United States must act and we must lead. While developed countries are making strides, inequality continues to build, and the full impact on growth is yet to be felt. With the fate of underdeveloped countries resting on fiscal support from governments, the actions of central banks, and crucially, the distribution of vaccines. Well, it has been a year since the pandemic completely changed our world. I recently caught up with Melinda Gates, co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which has committed $1.75 billion in the fight against COVID. On the latest edition in Bloomberg Studio 1.0, I talked with Gates about the unequal distribution of vaccines and how it's not just up to philanthropy, but government to step up. Take a listen. Well, I think we still have a ways to go. You know, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel here in the United States, but until all Americans are vaccinated, we still have a ways to go. Um, but, you know, it's going to be a while until the entire world is vaccinated. So this is going to still be with us the next few years. And I think we're going to have to really watch these variants that will be bouncing around the world. That's actually still quite concerning. What is it about the variants that concern you? Well, because every time a virus, we know viruses mutate, but when they mutate, you know, they can become sometimes more deadly or more contagious. And so anytime you see these mutations, we need to be on top of them in terms of surveillance. And then we're going to have to figure out, do we need to tune various vaccines to take care of them? So your foundation has committed $1.75 billion to the fight against COVID. I know your team is very diligent about looking at where and how that money is spent. In your view, where is the vaccine rollout working and what's not working? Well, I think it's working in some of our high income countries. We're starting to finally see, you know, much broader distribution, for instance, in the United States and in some of the European countries, but it is not at all working yet for middle and low income countries. And, you know, those are places where people are struggling. Uh, they have their loved ones who get ill. They can't get them to a hospital, much less an ICU. And so they are really still struggling in many countries around the world. So there's obviously a moral case for vaccine equity, but what about the economic case? Why should somebody in New York or San Francisco care when somebody in Africa gets the vaccine? Well, absolutely, it's the right moral thing to do. But economically, we're not going to have a swift a recovery in the United States or in Europe if we don't make sure that everybody gets vaccinated, because what will happen is this disease, you know, we know it crosses borders. We've seen it all over the world. And so as these variants break out, they will absolutely come back into the United States and Europe and Japan. And so our supply chains won't fully be up and running. We won't get our travel industry fully in leisure up and running or the business community up and running in terms of travel. So economically, if we're going to reopen the global economy, we've got to take care of this everywhere. I wonder if you think we're going to see the most meaningful change in the world coming from philanthropy, coming from wealthy people like yourself who can make certain things a priority rather than governments in the future. Is that how the world is going to change? No, I don't think so. I think what we should expect is that philanthropy can also often take risks. They can try innovations that sometimes work and sometimes fail. They can look for new solutions. They can help us collect the data. But ultimately, it's always up to government to scale up these um, innovations to create this change. The, the vaccine for COVID is a perfect example. 
Those are pharmaceutical companies working with philanthropists and investors, but working with the government. Ultimately, it's billions of dollars from the government that will pull that vaccine through and purchase it for Americans and people in low-income countries. So it's always up to government, but I think philanthropy or private sector and civil society can always help lead the way. Part of my interview there with Melinda Gates, co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. You can catch the full interview, the latest Studio 1.0 this weekend, playing at various times throughout the region. You can watch it at Bloomberg.com or, as always, you can download the podcast. Our full episode list is there. All right, our Ed Ludlow back now with more. Of course, we've been touting the White House CHIP Summit happening next week. A number of prominent CHIP executives have been invited. We know a little bit more about who those executives will be, Ed. What and who are you watching? Yeah, well, it's a good thing that Taiwan Semiconductor, one of the companies at the heart of this whole global chip supply story, had earnings late on Thursday night. U.S. depository receipts softer by about half a percent, but flip up the boards, and this is really the story. At a time where supply is so limited, it is no surprise that sales for the world's biggest chip maker, the company that actually manufactures the chips, surged. Third straight quarter of record sales. That growth level still at double digits. Come with me into my Bloomberg and look at this chart, though. There is a geopolitical story here. This is Taiwan's exports and imports, the exports being the white line. They are surging, and the value of them is also surging because TSMC does a lot of its chip manufacturing in Taiwan, and there's a lot of demand for its chips as we face this global shortage. The question for President Biden and all of those CEOs on Monday, largely American CEOs, is how do we fix the balance? How can the U.S. get in on the act on some of those different exports of semiconductors. They're going to have a big toss on their hands if you look at this next board and flip it up on my screen back here in the studio. Because the issue is investment. We know that Intel wants to put $20 billion into domestic manufacturing of semiconductors here in the US. But its Asian rivals, Samsung and TSMC, have both pledged $100 billion, five times what Intel plans to spend. So that's what we're looking for signs of on Monday. What is the fix here? How do you get more supply quickly? How long is it going to take? And hopefully we'll get some inside scoops of what's happening in the White House. Emily. Absolutely, Ed. We know some of the executives uh, attending include executives from TSMC, Intel, also some of the car companies, Ford and GM. Thanks so much for that update. We'll be all over that next week. All right, coming up, the infamous WeWork debacle captured the attention of the world in 2019. Now, the company's rise and fall is featured in a new Hulu documentary, WeWork or the making and breaking of a $47 billion unicorn. More from filmmaker Jed Rothstein next. He'll be with us. This is Bloomberg. Working company WeWork, founded by Adam Newman and heavily backed by SoftBank, was valued at as much as $47 billion two years ago. But plans for an IPO imploded in 2019 after investors raised concerns about its business model and Newman's management style. The co-founder and former CEO was pushed aside, and the pandemic has driven WeWork to close many of its locations, cut thousands of jobs, and renegotiate leases just to survive. Now, WeWork is in the process of going public after all via a SPAC deal with BOEX acquisition, and the agreement will value it at $9 billion. Still a big deal, but certainly not what it was, including debt. That is more than five times lower than its peak valuation. This coming as Hulu has a new documentary out titled WeWork, or the making and breaking of a $47 billion unicorn, directed by Oscar-nominated filmmaker Jed Rothstein. The film covers 2008 to 2019, when WeWork. Crumble. Jed joins me now. Jed, thank you so much for joining us. The story has been thank so you. fascinating, a roller coaster over the last couple of years. And I'm curious, as you were reporting this out, what was the thing that surprised you most about this story? Well, I knew the outlines of what had happened to the company and um, Adam's journey as the leader of it. But I didn't understand the journey that so many of the people who worked there took. And it was really interesting to learn about the many, many people who helped make the company and the sort of quilt of experiences that went into what became the WeWork story. How many ex-WeWork employees did you speak to for this project? 
we spoke to dozens of people, of course, not all of them are in the film, but in the process of researching it and finding out whose stories uh, would be best representative of the overall story. We spoke to dozens of people from all uh, areas of the company, from high up executives to uh, mid-level folks, to some of the people just on the ground in the different offices who made WeWork tick. And what was their main message? What did they think went so wrong? I think what was interesting to me is that a lot of the people who joined, especially as younger millennials, or even some of the people who were a little older who joined it in more senior positions, felt like there really was a there there. There really was um, something to the idea and their, their experiences there were very meaningful to them, which is what sort of gives the story and the film, I think, some heart. Because in the end, when things go south and Adam is pushed out and the IPO is canceled, I think they felt very betrayed because they really believed in something that was real. And so um, it was, uh, you know, people have different reasons describing uh, Adam's hubris or getting out over his skis or drinking too much of his own Kool-Aid and believing too much of his own hype. And um, all of those things are true. I think they also point to uh, the pressures from the big investors who obviously expected WeWork to live up to its billing as a tech company and to have these incredible growth metrics. And when it was clear from the S1 that that wasn't likely to be the case at that point, um, that certainly drove it down. But I think what, what from a narrative perspective and from a sort of human understanding perspective was most interesting is that people really uh, felt that their experiences there were meaningful and important. Now, you center on this video of Adam trying to put together an IPO roadshow video where he's struggling. Right. How did you get your hands on that footage? You know, I can't really get into the sort of journalistic methods and sources in, in that regard, but I can say that it was, to me, it was very revealing. Uh, I knew from when we started the film that it was fairly unlikely that Adam would participate because he was in the middle of a bunch of litigation. Uh, but I felt it was important to see this man who had really built this company by being an incredible salesman and who spent hours and hours and hours in front of video cameras, always sort of turned on to, to get behind the scenes of that a little bit. And so that video to me is really revealing because you see him sort of unable to do this thing that he does so well. Um, he was unable to just deliver a pitch to video, which is something he'd done hundreds or thousands of times. Um, to me, it's, it's sort of like the pinnacle moment of needing to do that right before you finally go public which is something he should have been able to do very easily and he couldn't, I wonder, you know, makes me think about what might have been going on in his head at this moment and all the pressures that he was under and that ultimately, um, you know, he couldn't quite get over at that moment. Now, in the short period of time since WeWork's implosions, there have been stories told many times in books, podcasts, there are movies in productions. How did you push yourself yes. to tell something different about this story and why should people watch it? I, you know, I think, number one, you've probably heard the basic outlines of the story, but you don't know the people until you see them. And I think, as we see in so many areas of life, when you can see videotape of people and you can really um, learn more about them and understand them better as characters, you understand much more about what they did and why they did it. So there's, uh, there's a profundity to that. Uh, I also think that I tried to focus on, rather than just making a simple morality tale about you know Adam's hubris and therefore he's bad and the venture capital markets that pushed him to take so many risks and go so big so fast or bad. I tried to look at uh, the story th from the perspective of the different people who worked there and really understand the human side of it and understand the basic questions uh, that WeWork was asking and answering about how we live and work together and kind of take from that um, hopefully some lessons about how we can rebuild and rethink capitalism as we emerge from this terrible uh, pandemic and really are rethinking so many things. So to me, the story is, um, it's, it's something of a journey through the era that just ended. It's something of a uh, fable of this time that's in the past, even though it was just a year or two ago, it seems like the distant past. And I hope we can take some, some lessons from that and have some fun remembering what about it was good and what about it was uh, maybe off the rails. And even though Adam didn't participate in the film, have you heard anything from his team, any reaction, um, any context? I heard anecdotally that he hadn't watched it, but was going to, but I, 
you know, I haven't heard any sort of clear sense from him. I haven't heard, I haven't gotten a formal reaction from him uh, in terms of and any whether thoughts, he liked the film. Uh, you know, I, right. Any thoughts on, on the outlook for the, the WeWork of today? I mean, it's still a $9 billion company. It's, it's not nothing, but it is certainly a shadow of what it once was. You know, I would imagine that a company like WeWork or other co-working companies would be pretty well positioned to come out of this um, period of the COVID and the pandemic uh, and do well. Because as I'm sure you report often, and as we read in the news, a lot of uh, large companies, and they were turning their business towards um, enterprise companies, are deciding that they want to have less space and more flexible arrangements, and they're shedding these big leases and something like WeWork probably offers a lot of solutions for them. Uh, I, I know that they're going public through a, a SPAC. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert on SPACs, but that's a, an interesting way to come to market. Um, and I know that, um, you know, they've pared back some of the uh, elements of the company that perhaps were, were problematic when they tried to go public a year ago. So my, my hunch is they'll probably do well, but I'd leave that Emily, to you and your colleagues in the in the financial press to pick apart a little more. Absolutely. We're going to be covering the next chapter of WeWork right here on Bloomberg Technology. Um, and if you want to learn the background, check out Jed's Phil and Jed Rothstein, director of WeWork or the making and breaking of a $47 billion unicorn. Jed, thanks so much for joining us. You can catch the documentary on Hulu. All right, coming up, virtual events have taken center stage in the pandemic, creating new revenue streams and opportunities for artists. We're gonna take a look at one platform making it all possible. That is next, this is Bloomberg. The pandemic has kept many of us apart, but also brought so many of us together. From virtual comedy shows to cooking classes and award shows and concerts, we've seen a complete shift in the streaming landscape, offering artists and fans ways to connect on levels never seen before and generate new revenue streams. So is the new way of tuning into a rock concert from your living room here to stay? And will artists actually benefit? I'm joined now by Calvin Lay, CEO of InLive, a company that's dubbed itself the Shopify of online experiences. Calvin, welcome. So how exactly does it work? So we've actually created a new streaming platform that's designed specifically for the entertainment industry uh, that gives power back to producers to create shows, not videos, uh, but shows that are in their vision and in their brand directly to their consumer. Uh, so what producers of content do is they use our technology to get HD streaming capabilities, access control and ticketing, uh, and multi-casting distribution to multiple places, all within a direct-to-consumer type of experience where they can control the look, feel, uh, branding, and uh, relationships with their fans. So we're looking at video of some amazing artists from Elton John to Bon Jovi. What have been the most successful live events so far? Wow, you know, success is, uh, is in the beauty, the beauty is in the highs of the older. Uh, we've done so many different types of events across different types of verticals. For example, we helped uh, Mark Ruffalo uh, put on a live theatrical play uh, with Michael Sarah Gretchen Ball uh, to benefit his alma mater, Stella Adler Academy. Uh, we've done uh, live photo shoots uh, and transforming uh, photo shoots with Spin Magazine into one hour variety shows. Uh, with people like uh, Rico Nasty. Uh, and we just did a movie premiere uh, last night, uh, a movie called North Hollywood, uh, executive produced by Pharrell Williams, uh, featuring Vince Vaughn, Miranda Cosgrove, Ryer uh, McLaughlin, and several others. Uh, so w depending on what right. you mean by success, I think they've all been powerful and successful. And it's not just concerts. Uh, we're looking at video of Mark Ruffalo doing a, a Broadway play via your platform. But I'm curious, how much of this virtual uh, event format is here to stay and, and will be done in, in combination with live in-person events? And how much does this start to die once everyone's vaccinated and life goes back to some sort of new normal? Great question. I think uh, the, the toothpaste is out of the tube. It's sort of like when your eyes are open with HDTV, you don't go back to SDTV. 
uh, people have realized that a virtual experience is not a replacement for live in person. It's not a replacement for television broadcast. It is yet another powerful way for you to consume, uh, create content, and even more so, in create very engaging uh, relationships between artists, producers, and fans, something that you can't really get because of the barriers of the geography, timing, uh, and uh, the lack of interactivity in some of the other formats that are out there in entertainment today. And last quick question, how much will this impact revenue streams? Are these new revenue streams? Does this take away from what they might have made in person? When uh, working with uh, a lot of the industry insiders, uh, big to independent uh, producers of content, they really view this as widening the market space. Uh, this is going to be a great augmentation okay. to the existing uh, revenue streams that they have. Uh, it's going to actually give them new channels. Uh, we've been working with NPR shows that allow them to do uh, streams that bring audio to video to life, and they can do more okay. explicit and, and powerful interactive content uh, through streaming that supports and adds to what they see and hear on the radio right now. Calvin? We'll have to leave it there. Kevin Lway, in live founder and CEO, thanks so much for joining us. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Happy Friday. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.